Hi there, it's Tracy from Natural Childbirth World and today I have the privilege of speaking to a, an amazing person, a world renowned expert in all things natural birth. Her name is Dr. Sarah Buckley. If you're not familiar with Sarah's work, let me just fill you in a, li a little bit. Um, she's originally from New Zealand now lives in, in Brisbane, near Brisbane, in sunny Queensland, Australia. She's written several books, including her bestseller, Gentle Birth, Gentle Mothering. Put a picture on the screen there. I was actually lent this when I was pregnant for my first baby almost five years ago. It was, very, it was a, a great read. Um, amazing information. She's a GP, family physician, with qualifications in GP obstetrics. And she's also a mother of four beautiful children who, surprisingly, you might find, that were all born at home. Uh, she's been featured in several films, including the latest one, Freedom of Birth, and has been described as a person who is who marries the medical mind and the birthing woman's body wisdom. She's into ecstatic birth, attachment parenting, co-sleeping, long-term breastfeeding, lotus birth, raising babies without nappies and diapers, yoga in pregnancy, and mothering and uh, gentle discipline plus she's also launched a new website which we'll talk about a little later so Sarah thank you so much for joining me today thanks Tracy a pleasure to be here and thank you for the work that you do I love your ebook it's a real it's a great read oh thank you so much I really appreciate that all right so look there's so many things I could ask you because you know there I could really delve into some things in depth you know being a bit of a birth junkie myself but I really want to um, you know, there's a lot of people that follow our website and on our Facebook page and they are new mothers or perhaps they've not had a, a first, uh, you know, their first birth experience hasn't been great. So I kind of want to ask some questions for them. And um, some of the topics I've sort of picked out today that I want to touch on is what you call ecstatic birth. Then I've got some questions that people have asked on our Facebook page. Um, an interesting one I found, raising babies without nappies. I have to ask you about that. And, well, of course, your new website. So, first of all, let's start with ecstatic birth. What do you mean by ecstatic birth? Well, ecstatic birth, if you look at the, what the word actually means, it means, ek means outside and static means place. So, it's an experience that takes us outside ourselves. So, I use the term in that sense. But I also use it in a, in a physiological sense, you could say, because what I say about ecstatic birth, I say it's Mother Nature's um, superb design for mothers and babies. It's a, it's a blueprint. It's a hormonal blueprint that Mother Nature has for every mammalian mother and baby. And there's a lot of hormones that release, we release during labor and birth. And when I talk about ecstatic birth, I talk about in particular four of the hormones. And if you want to know more about this, I recommend you go to my website, sarahbuckley.com, and download my free ebook called Ecstatic Birth, Nature's Hormonal Blueprint for Labor. So I talk about the hormone oxytocin, hormone of love, the hormone beta endorphin, which is a hormone of pleasure and transcendence. I talk about adrenaline and noradrenaline, hormones of excitement, and prolactin, which is a hormone of breastfeeding and tender mothering. And we get peak levels of all of those hormones um, during labor and at that time of birth and for the hour after birth. So we're, we're saturated. We, we've got these um, extreme levels of love, of pleasure and transcendence, of excitement and of tenderness and tender mothering. So it's, a, it's an ecstatic hormonal cocktail, you could say. And it's not just – Mother Nature doesn't design it just as a good feeling. You know, if you've had a – a really positive experience of birth, you'll know what I'm talking about, all of those amazing euphoria and ecstasy that you feel when you meet your baby. But it's not just about a good feeling. It's actually about survival for mothers and babies. So when the mother gets this big head of ecstasy on peak levels of her ecstatic hormones, it actually protects her from bleeding from those high levels of oxytocin. Um, it makes sure that she bonds to her baby. You know, it, um, it activates the reward centers in her brain so that she will um, be, as I say, positively addicted to her baby because that's about species survival. You know, that look, that feeling you have when you look in your baby's eyes is not just a good feeling. It's really mother nature making sure that you're rewarded and motivated enough to do all those things that every mammalian mother does for her baby, which is carry, you know, for us we need to carry our babies around 24-7 for most of human history. That's been a necessity. And we need to breastfeed. So all of these hormones also optimize breastfeeding. You know, the oxytocin and the beta endorphin that are released in labor begin to stimulate prolactin release. It starts to switch on the milk production for you and your baby. So ecstatic birth is Mother Nature's superb design and it really optimizes outcomes for mothers and babies, not just in terms of safety at birth but also in terms of ease and pleasure and ongoingly optimizes breastfeeding and mother-baby attachment. 
Like, I find it interesting because obviously you have that credibility of, of being a doctor and um, so it it sort of sounds like a lot of the stuff where, you know, say I will talk about I'm not medically trained or other people who are childbirth educators or, or midwives sometimes can come across as all this stuff's a bit hippie, but it's not, is it? No, no, it's not hippie <laughs> at all. It's just, it's normal. It's what Mother Nature designs. It's our, it's our physiology in fact, you know, the new the, the new way we describe it, we say physiologic birth, you know, childbirth that is um, follows our physiologic blueprint, the way our body processes are designed to operate. So it's not a hippie, it's not out there. I mean, it, it is different to our normal um, obstetric system, our no, normal maternity care system. And, you know, I would say from a hormonal perspective, one of the reasons that women have so much difficulty in labor and birth is that their hormonal orchestration doesn't flow. And the main reason that our hormonal orchestration doesn't flow when we get stuck in a, in a hospital in an unfamiliar environment is exactly the same if it was a cat or a dog or a horse. And people that breed animals know that, you know, the core requirement for the laboring female is that she feels private and safe and, and, and essentially unobserved but we don't sort of apply that to women we put them in a situation where they're not private they're on totally foreign territory they've got strangers looking after them and they're intensely observed and all of these things in, in, any other man would switch labor off and that's essentially what happens to women in labor that levels of the fight or flight hormones go up and her labor gets turned off and it can't even deprive the baby of blood and oxygen so when we put women in this foreign and your know, unphysiological situation, it's no surprise that many women need um, intervention because labour slows down and because their baby is deprived of blood and oxygen. And that's just a hormonal effect. It's the, the fight or flight hormones kicking in, as they should do in, in, for all mammalian mothers. Right. So say I, I saw your example in your in your book where you have, you know, the, the cat and you're showing, you know, how the cat labours in the cupboard and, you know, when you disturb it, it... it you know, obviously slows labor down and things like that. So, so what you're saying is, say, you know, your partner drives you, speeds you to the hospital in the car, and you're going over every bump, and then you put on it, you know, a um, birthing bed, and you've got fluoro lights on. Are you saying that that pretty much slows birth and changes, you know, doesn't optimize the right hormones? Well, most women find that when they go into hospital, you know, it's all been going well at home, and you move into hospital, and you know, suddenly things slow down or even stop. And it takes you a while to settle in and, again, feel comfortable, feel, you know, like... It, it, and it's really operating at the primal level, the things I'm talking about. It's our primal systems. It's the middle layer of our brain called the limbic system. So it's not a conscious thing. You can't talk yourself into feeling safe somewhere. Yeah. And uh, w one way to look at it, it's a bit like the conditions that we need for having a baby are very similar to the conditions we need for making a baby. So it's almost exactly the same hormonal orchestration. And you could imagine, imagine that same scenario. You know, you're trying to make a baby and then you get shipped off to hospital and you're in this strange room and nothing's really going to happen, is it? <laughs> so you may settle down and feel private and safe again and then the whole thing can flow. And it's, the, it's exactly the same situation for, for having a baby. And you know, that's quite a good rule of thumb, really. If you want the ideal conditions for labor and birth, you think about the ideal conditions for making a baby. And, uh, you know, bright lights and strangers coming in and out through an unlocked door is, is not ideal, you know, and at the very minimum, if you're going to hospital, you need someone to protect your space. Right. So that was going to be my next question: um, is how do you then have a you know an, an ecstatic birth and conditions that are optimum? Say if you're, uh, I can understand how you can do it at home, but obviously a lot of people are not comfortable at home this day and age. Many of the people that are on our website and our Facebook page are going to a hospital. How do we have that ecstatic birth at a hospital? Well, there's a couple of things to say. Um, the, the whole hormonal system, there's a whole lot of what we call positive feedback loops. The hormones just get building on themselves. And that happens as labor progresses. As you, as you go into labor, you sort of get deeper into it, you could say. And it's the early stages of labor where you're most likely to get disrupted by your environment. So huh. one thing is to stay at home until you're really in established labor. And that can take a little while if you're a first-time mum. And I would really recommend um, generally if you're going to hospital that you have a supportive birth companion with you, also called a doula. And a doula is someone that generally you engage and you pay, someone who's experienced in this area, who's used to being in hospitals and working in hospitals, who can support you and also support your partner. You know, I don't think it's enough to just take your husband in there personally. I wouldn't do that. If I was going to hospital, I'd definitely have a doula right. um, support myself and my husband and to create that safe space. You know, they really know how to do that in the hospital setting. So have a doula, have her come 
and support you at home and then go to hospital with her and she can really um, give you some good advice. And, and, of course, the other option, and I think, at the moment, the only way to have your own midwife is to have your baby at home. But increasingly, there's models of care where you can have your own midwife who can come um, come to you in labour at home and then accompany you and care for you in hospital. And I think um, you know, in the next few years, we'll see that more and more available. And that's really the, the by far the best model of care possible for women because you have that person. And I remember myself with my first baby, you know, um, I went to labour at 36 weeks and I was at home mm-hmm. and I was a little, oh, my God, I'm a bit scared. This is a bit surprising, you know. Um, and... I remember my midwife walked in the door and just seeing her, I just totally relaxed. I thought, wow, I feel really safe with this woman. I know her through all the time, all the times we've had together in my pregnancy. She knows me, I know her. And there was something that relaxed in me that allowed me to give birth to my baby about 20 minutes later. Um, So, you know, having someone to, to, to help to protect your space is really important. And if you're going to hospital, it's even more important. So I'd really recommend having a doula. Um, at least having someone that's comfortable with the whole birth scenario and comfortable with working in hospitals. And I'd also recommend going to hospital later, you know, um, when labor is really established and the hormonal physiology is really flowing. Um, it's much less, less less interferable, you could say, by your environment at that stage. Right. Even I could even say that sometimes um, towards the very end of labor and birth, um, you know, getting a, a little bit of fear or anxiety or feeling a little bit... Um, uh, unsafe can actually trigger labour. It's a reflex um, for mammals birthing in the wild when you're close to the time of birth. Sometimes it can actually promote labour. So that's that story where you go into a hospital at the last minute and you have your baby like 20 minutes later because the sort of unfamiliarity can even trigger labour. And, um, um, you know, yeah, so going into hospital later, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend that. And, and I can understand that that might be, be a bit tricky. So, you know, have your own birth companion, with you. have your own daughter to come home, come to your home and accompany you. Mm-hmm. What about a lot of people will obviously have an obstetrician, depending on what country they're in. Um, it seems that Australia and the US, especially the UK, uh, I don't think as much, but you know they all hire those obstetricians. And I and I often ask. Um, I was talking to my cousin on the weekend, and I said, "Oh, so so why did you hire an obstetrician? Was it was there something wrong? Were you guys high risk or something?" And they said, "Oh no, well it was just you know we wanted the best care and." It really wasn't going to cost us that much with our insurance and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, are they not an extra companion at, at birth that would be, you know, beneficial or how does how does that affect labour, I guess? That's a great question. That's a great question. And um, I think that, you know, instinctively we do know that we need that continuity of care. We need, know that we need someone familiar in labour and the only way that's available to us in the current system, apart from hiring a doula, is to have your own obstetrician. Yeah. But the truth is, well, first of all, you're not really going to see much of them in labour. They'll probably only just come at the end. The second thing is you've got to consider that obstetricians aren't trained in normal birth. They're not the experts in normal birth. That's a midwife. Mm. So obstetricians are trained in high-risk birth, and they see a lot of high-risk things. They see a lot of things go wrong, and that's perfectly, that's exactly as it should be. They're specialists in the area. Mm. So it's sometimes a little hard for them to... to um, facilitate or even understand natural birth. I don't really see very many of them. You know, an obstetrician could go through years of training and not actually see a woman have totally natural birth. So if you're wanting a natural birth, you know, it's like going to McDonald's and asking for a porterhouse steak. You're just not going to the right place if you want a natural birth. Um, Marston Wagner, who used to work for the World Health Organization, he's a um, perinatologist, a high, highly trained obstetrician, and he said, you know, having an obstetrician attend a healthy woman in labour and birth is like having a paediatrician come and babysit your healthy two-year-old. It's just right. it's just not necessary. It's an, uh, an, an over um, overuse of technology. And the other way that I, I talk about it, because my background is as a GP, you know, um, when people come to see me as a GP, you know, they're coming to see me for primary care and I'm the expert in that and they've got a headache and I can say, well, you know, we do this test and you might need this or you might need that. Um, but if they went straight to a neurosurgeon with a headache and then the neurosurgeon would do a lot more fancy things because they see people with serious conditions with headaches and it's exactly the same thing in pregnancy. You know, a pregnant woman really needs someone to give them primary care, which again is really you know, the specialty function of a midwife. And um, at the moment we don't have a lot of availability of your midwife in hospital, um, in the hospital system. Some hospitals do have some schemes where you can have, have your own midwife, the hospital will give you your own midwife. Um, and birth centres in particular, I really recommend a much better model of care than, than, um, than getting your own obstetrician. And you're much more likely to have a good outcome. You know, if you look at the risks in private hospitals, the risk of all the interventions are significantly 
higher. So just looking at the figures, you know, you'd say that the best choice for a natural birth is to um, is to hire your own midwife, hire your own doula, um, and, and not and not actually go down the private hospital route. What I'd like to move on to now is um, some of the questions we've got through Facebook. So um, first of all, I have. Um, Jeanette from Michigan, she has been asking, what do you feel is the biggest unnecessary birth intervention women face and um, what do you feel can or should be done to change it? I think there's a couple of things and, and what I just talked about before is that the, the core requirements for the labouring female of any mammalian species, including women, is that we feel private, safe and unobserved in labour. So you could say the first intervention is providing an environment where women don't feel private, safe and unobserved and all the rest of the interventions often follow that. So when we don't feel private and safe then our fight or flight hormones, adrenaline and noradrenaline kick in and they slow our labour down. They can actually deprive our baby of blood and oxygen and our labour gets slowed so we need, you know, um, synthetic oxytocin, pitocin, syntocin on to speed it up and then it's too fast and the baby's suffering and we need an emergency caesarean or we need a vacuum or a forceps. And uh, then we have a postpartum hemorrhage because of those drugs in labour. So but the first intervention really is that we don't provide physiologic conditions for labouring women. And, you know, I really recommend that women take that seriously and, and organise that for themselves. You know, get themselves a scenario for birthing, an environment where they feel private and safe and as unobserved as possible. So home birth is an ideal if you don't want to have your baby at home. That's totally fine, but you need to have someone in hospital that's going to protect your space. The other thing that I'm concerned about, which is really worth considering when you're pregnant, especially first-time mothers, is induction of labour. And that's an intervention that tends to have that, what we call, cascade of intervention effect. So if you're induced, your contractions are more painful and you'll need some form of pain relief. And the pain relief, it's an epidural or um, an opiate drug can slow labour down. And, you know, um, things flow on and then you can't push and then you need forceps or a vacuum or a caesarean or your baby goes into distress. So that's a cascade of intervention and you know the initiating factor for many women is induction of labour. So you really need to consider is it do you really need to be induced? And a lot of inductions are happening for social reasons. You know, the woman, you know, we say we're sick of being pregnant, we want to get the pregnancy over, but but really the end of pregnancy is that time when your baby is it's really important to your baby. Your baby's brain is finishing off their development. Um, your baby's getting ready to be born, all the organ systems are maturing so that they can function optimally for life outside the womb. So that's one of the most important times of pregnancy is those last days and weeks. And I really recommend that women don't, um, don't bypass those and, and, and accept induction for non-medical purposes. And I also have a lot to say about induction for post-dates for going overdue. You can read a lot about it in my book, Gentle Birth, Gentle Mothering. But again, I really... I think the risks of going overdue are way overplayed um, in most uh, maternity care systems. At, at the most, the risk for the baby is one in 300. And so 299 women out of 300 who go you know, a week or so, more than a week overdue, are not gonna, are gonna have a good outcome. So, you know, if you're induced, especially first time, you know, your body hasn't been through all labor and birth and it takes longer to get started. And the other thing is, when you look at the, the physiologic research, when we look at other animals, a lot of this research is done on rats, yeah. So rats have a, a day, on day 22, every rat goes into labor and, and gives birth. But women are really different to that. There's a wide variety of, of due dates, you could say, for women. Some women will naturally go into labor at 37 weeks. Some women will naturally go into labor at 42 weeks. So, we, you know, the, the estimated date of delivery, the estimated due date is very approximate for women. And... Now, if you induce someone at 39 weeks, they may be two or three weeks from really being ready. And, you know, from the baby being ready. And it's the baby that signals labour. You know, the baby says, yes, I'm ready to be born. I'll, I'll put your body into labour. That's the way it happens. So we're really, um, you know, doing a disservice to our babies and not letting them get that full readiness and ripeness for life outside the womb when we induce. So um, in terms of, of um, avoiding significant interventions, I think avoiding induction is a really good idea. But what, what happens if, say, um, I'm, I'm guessing it's most of the, the obstetricians saying, well, no, we need to do this. And there is a, I hear about a lot of pressure from obstetricians to induce labour. No, we can't. No, we can't. I mean, I've even had the, the pressure and I, you know, just... It was almost to a point where I thought, I'm, I'm just not going to go, go in. And I know that's, that's not good because you really should be, you know, working with those, uh, with your caregivers. But... Um, 
I just I find that there is this um, white coat mentality. You know, you want to they kind of scare you into things. And how do you how do you question someone that you feel has that authority? Well, it is tricky. I, I agree. And again, I'd recommend having your own advocate, having a doula, having someone that you can talk these things through with, right. and um, not necessarily that she's going to give you advice. But you know, you want to have someone to bounce the ideas around, and someone who'll support you. And if you want to have a natural birth, and um, from my point of view, that's by far the best outcome for mothers and babies, um, then you really need to limit the, the use of interventions and. Um, you know, you need to question those things and whether you question them in the room or the consulting room where you go away and talk about it with your doula and you say, God, I don't want to have that intervention. Um, and it's your body and your baby and your choice in the end and you're the one that's going to have to live with the consequences of it if your baby really isn't ready and ends up in NICU and you miss those early days with your baby, you know. These things can happen as a consequence of getting pushed into something. And I know it is. I'm not saying that it's necessarily easy to stand up um, to that, but this is, this is welcome to parenthood, you know, you're going to be in that situation the rest of your life as a parent, people are going to have ideas about what you should or should not be doing, yeah. and it's your job really to stand up for what you know is the right thing for yourself and your baby, and, and the last thing I want to say about that is, you know, I talk about science and physiology, but I'm a mum as well, and I know that mothers and babies are connected at this very deep level, and I know that you can communicate with your baby, I know that babies send messages to mums, you know, mm. and you can check in with your baby and say, is this the time to be born, you know, I know that that communication is happening all the time in a physiologic sense, and I really believe that it's happening on every level between mothers and babies, I mean, imagine being sort of, you know, glued on to another human being for nine months, you'd get pretty close to each other, and you'd have a whole lot of unspoken communication, so I really believe that it happens with mothers and babies, and what I mean by that is as a mum, you can really trust your intuition. You know, people tell me a lot of stories about this. I had a story of a mum who was um, agreed to be induced because the obstetrician was going away on holiday. Mm. And she said, when I went into that room, I just had a really bad feeling about it. I thought I shouldn't be here. But he said it was okay, so it was okay. And she had a bad outcome with her baby. And alternatively, you know, there's other people who who really need intervention. And, and I know women who have said, you know, I got this message from my baby. My baby really needs help. And I thought that was crazy, so I didn't go and do anything about it. So it can go either way. And I really advise women to listen to your body and listen to your baby. That's one of my big take-home messages is, you know, trust your body, trust your baby, and trust birth. That's really interesting. And I think women a lot of the time forget that and they may not be used to hearing that from, you know, a doctor. They're, okay. they're, used, they're used to hearing that from, you know, People like myself or their midwives or their doulas, you know. So, um, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, just also, Gracie from Tennessee had asked, if you could say something, send a message to obstetricians who you said before some may have not even witnessed, you know, a fully natural birth, what would your message be to them then? The system is designed to work. You know, we've got this whole physiology that's, you could say package deal, it's designed to work in particular ways. And when we start interfering with it, we don't really know what the ongoing consequences are. And the problem with medicalized childbirth is we haven't really researched it. You know, we don't have a lot of information about what the impact of various interventions are, particularly in the medium to long term. And again, this is a bit of a consequence of our, um, our maternity care system of using specialists because you've got to see your specialist, your obstetrician, and all they see you for is the duration of your pregnancy and perhaps the next one, but maybe not. So they don't ever see what happens down the line with breastfeeding, with your relationship with your child, your health and well-being. They don't see the long-term consequences of what happens around the time of birth. And you know, as, and we don't have a lot of research on that. We haven't really looked at that. But as a mum, I know that what happens for me around the time of birth, how pleasurable it is, or how difficult it is or am I traumatized I can take that into the rest of my life ongoingly I can certainly take that into my relationship with my child you know I know some women have said to me the day my child was born was one of the worst most traumatic days of my life wow. and that's really difficult to take into your parents you know you love your child but you've got that memory that's associated with them whereas other nature's design is that the day your child's born is the best day of your life and their life as well so yeah it, it, Consider the long-term impact of things and really look at the evidence and um, consider that birth is designed to work in a whole lot of complex, intricately orchestrated ways that we're only really beginning to understand. And one way that I look at it, I think how we thought about breastfeeding you know, 20 or 30 years ago, we thought it was just, it didn't really matter, the baby was just as good on the bottle, um, you know, women's bodies didn't really work that well, they didn't really make enough milk. 
And it turns out that the women's bodies not make enough milk in breastfeeding because we weren't giving them the right conditions. And mm. from my point of view, it's exactly the same in birth. We're only really beginning to discover the, the huge benefit and the long-term um, benefits from natural childbirth. And you know, to really um, make it, to optimise outcomes for mothers and babies, we need to again look at the environment that we're providing for women. Last Facebook question is Kate from Maroochydore. Uh, near you and she and that's in Australia for anyone who, who's not from here um, if there's any one only one piece of advice you could share with pregnant women what would it be my advice is always trust your baby trust your body and trust birth Great. we really have we've got millions and millions of years of evolution behind us and all of our bodies are superbly designed for labor and birth and we really can trust the process fantastic okay so let's go on to this other interesting topic which I find um, you know, fascinating that you're interested in babies without nappies. Um, I, I've seen I've seen something on this in one of the birthing movies that I've watched. But when you say raising baby without nappies, what age are we talking about? Well, you can start from the newborn age. I mean, it's basically the idea. He, again, you know, a lot of my material comes from anthropology, from um, comparative. Um, biology, looking at other species, so you know, lots of other animals keep their babies in nests and no animal wants the baby to, you know, to eliminate in the nest, so there's always some method of taking the baby out or controlling the baby's elimination, and that's true of human babies as well, so babies have a system that's, um, that allows them to communicate with the caregiver around their elimination needs, and if you've never thought about it, it's a bit of a wild <laughs> idea, but but once you sort of switch into it, you can actually see that babies do communicate this need. And it makes sense. You know, the baby with a full bladder at any age is uncomfortable, so they'll cry. But we don't sort of have, a, have it on our list of actions to take with crying babies. And, but once you start to think about it, you think, oh, well, my baby could be having a full bladder. And then it's a matter of um, setting up a system of communication with your baby where you each understand each other's communication so that you know, your baby cries, you, you realize they've got a full bladder, you take them to a place. And, and allow them to, to eliminate. And um, it's really quite fun. <laughs> it's a <laughs> fun thing to do. It, it blew me away that, that babies have this capacity that I never knew about. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, I just every time I think about it, I'm like, it kind of makes sense once you think about it. But, I, but what I want to know is really, you know, I live in Sydney. I'm in, you know, pretty residential, touristy area. I live in Manly, which is... Um, uh, over the Harbour Bridge, you know, is this something that's really practical for someone like myself or is this something for, you know, let's talk about hippies again living on a farm. Love hippies, <laughs> love hippies. I'm, my, aunt, <laughs> my aunt's the biggest hippie ever, but I just wonder, is it really practical? Oh, totally it is. And it's, um, I mean, it's something that most women in other cultures do and, of course, we never had nappies or diapers till, you know, a few decades ago. So it's something that every every mother and baby did until, you know, the last recent generation, so um, so we designed to do it. And it's really about figuring out how it's gonna work for you. So for myself, for example, I used a, a little um, a little bucket, a little like sand bucket, sand, what do you call it, sand pit bucket, um, <laughs> that my baby sat on and she peed and pooed in that. Um, I used a, uh, a laundry tub, so she peed or pooed in a laundry tub. Um, I did use nappies or diapers part-time, but I was always really careful when she was wearing them so she hardly ever eliminated in them. Um, uh, it, it can be helpful to not have carpets at some stages when your baby starts <laughs> to walk. Um, but you know, when they get to the walking stage, you can use little pull-ups, little um, pull-up disposables or pull-up cloth um, pants, and um, you know, if the baby pees, well, you just change them. So th there's lots of ways around it. But the thing is, as I said, it's not. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Right. So you know, if you're a new mum or you know, you've got a baby under about six to twelve months. You actually know when your baby's going to poop. You know the look on their face. You know the squirming. You know the noises. Yeah. Yeah. What you do is take the nappy off and sit them on something that they can pee, they can poop in. And you know, as far as peeing, you know the most you know, like we all pee when we wake up, and that's true of babies too. So when they yeah. wake up, you take the nappy off, sit them on a little something, and it could be you could be holding them over a tub. There's a particular little squatting position you can hold them in, or you can sit them on a little bucket or a little potty, and. Um, and and they'll pee, you know. And the easiest way to do that to sort of get this communication going, but one of the names for it is elimination communication, yes. is to use a sound or a noise that is associated with it. So with my baby, I use the noise, which is a great one for starting <laughs> starting any kind of pee. So you know, um, 
when I wanted her to pee or poop, when she was, when I observed that she was peeing or pooping, I'd go, Psst. And then she associated that with it. And then when she was three months and I found out more about it, I held her over the laundry tub and I went, Psst, and she just peed. Oh, my so, God. That's like the noise with the, with the action. And then you use that as a means of communication. And once the babies get the hang of it or get the idea that you're, gonna, you're going to um, respond to that need, then they'll actually hold on and they'll actually signal more clearly. Um, so, you know, so they'll cry or some people actually use hand, hand um, sign language with their babies, you know, mm-hmm. because babies can do that before they can talk. So there's a sign language for potty. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and it's once, once a baby, once you get into the swing of it, you know, the baby, you can get this really clear communication going. And you're even, like I said before, that intuitive connection that you have with your baby. And I used to know when she needed to pee without her saying anything or, I remember going to a playgroup one time and she was in the sand pit and I was up in the kitchen and I thought, oh, she needs to pee. I just had that feeling. So you get this sort of communication going, a little bit like you do around breastfeeding. You just know when your baby needs to feed. You just have this sort of connection going. And it's the whole thing just on a, on a different level around, around what comes out rather than what goes in. <laughs> What's the biggest, I guess, reason for doing it? Is it because you don't want to spend money on nappies? Is it, is it easier? Like, how does it, why would you want to do it? Why would you want to do it? Well, there's a whole lot of – I did it because I was sort of interested and because, <laughs> for me, it seemed like the most, um, you could say, natural. It seemed to be part of our blueprint, really, that we did this with our babies. And yeah. um, some people have described nappies or, or diapers as walking toilets. So it is, is it fun for a baby to sit in one of those? No, it probably isn't. And, yeah. no, I didn't, I didn't go in with an outcome in mind, but what happened for my baby was that – about 14 months, she got completely independent in her toileting. I just would just have a little potty in each room and she'd just go and sit on it. So there was a huge saving in terms of toilet training. There's a huge saving in terms of cloth or disposable diapers. I mean, just much better time for Mother Earth. We're not disposing of things. We're not even yes. having to wash things most of the time. Um, it was quite a big commitment yeah. um, for myself. And my husband, you know, got a bit um, annoyed with it at times <laughs> because once sort of on this track, it's a little bit hard to go off it. Although, again, some people do do it part-time, you know, or some of some women go to work and train their nannies in it. Or, you know, in those traditional cultures, it's actually the, the grandmother that does this with the baby. So there's lots of different ways of doing it. I chose to do it in the night, which is a big commitment to sit up and, and put my baby on the potty when she needed to eliminate. But some people just put a, a diaper on at night. There's lots of different ways of doing it. And I, I took it on as a really full-time, 24-7 commitment, which was really big. But you can take it on as a smaller commitment. I mean, you can just catch the poop. When you know they're going to poop, you just catch the people when they wake up in the morning. And that's, that's pretty fun and pretty easy. And if your baby's those six months, generally that's not that difficult. After about six months, some babies sort of give up communicating around it because they think, oh, my God, this hasn't worked up till now. So they sort of give up. But if you've got a, like a, a really good relationship with your baby and you're, you know, you're responsive to your baby on, on, on every other level, you know, some babies can pick it up even up to a year. I, I went over to... My friend's place in America, and her baby was nine months, and I trained. You know, we trained. We trained him, in it, and she started doing it because he still had that communication. And you know, he was relieved. You could say that that someone was responding to that need that he had. Right. I think. I, I think all I worry about is like, especially when they're really newborn. You think the number threes. You know, the explosions. Like, oh, I don't know if I could do it with the number threes around. You know. Well, that's really easy because you're just putting them on a little bucket or a potty. There's nowhere for the number three to go except in the potty, you know. <laughs> so it does. I mean, I, you know, like over her years of toileting, I mean, I started doing it when she was three months, but, you know, right. the number of um, number of poopy nappies was really small, you know, five yeah. or six probably the whole time. Oh, my because God. Was like that. So, you know, a big saving in washing or or buying diapers, whatever you do. So, yeah, it was, and I, for me, I found it really fun. It was extraordinary. It was blew me away. The whole thing was extraordinary. It's a whole other level of relationship and communication and capacity that, that, that our babies have that we haven't recognised before. Yeah. Okay. How cool. Um, I think, can, I, I think there... more, there's an article on my website called um, Mothering Mindfulness and a Baby's Bottom. Right. <laughs> and it's back to elimination communication. And on... At the bottom of that, there's a whole lot of resources. But if you search elimination communication, it's also sometimes called natural infant hygiene okay. or early potty training are the different terms that, or infant potty training are the different terms that have been used for it. Great. I was going to ask, actually, is there a DVD or something you can watch? And... Oh, uh, yeah. And there's an Australian DVD called Nappy Free. Um, ah. 
um, by Nicole Moore. Yeah, that was a great DVD. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you for that. Um, all right, so let's um, talk about you've got a new website. Um, yes, you... I'm very excited. It's a membership website called gentlenaturalbirth.com. Mm -hmm. So this is aimed at um, pregnant women, at birth professionals, they can join up. And every week they get a video of me talking about a particular and important topic. I've covered things like um, early pregnancy discomfort, calculating your due date, ultrasound, why have an ultrasound, is ultrasound safe? I've done DVDs about um, early testing, the um, nuchal translucency screening, and I'm just in the middle of doing a series of DVDs around making um, wise decisions about induction, a little bit of what I mentioned before, epidurals and caesareans. So wow. a wealth of topics, and as well as that, every fortnight I have a webinar that people can come along to for free or access the recording on the website. And I've got a lot of material on my, on my membership website as well. I've got audios, videos, articles, and I'm adding to it all the time. And um, the great thing right now is because I'm just setting it up, people can just write and tell me what they want, and I'll make a, uh, a webinar or a DVD on those topics. So really mm -hmm. exciting for me, a um, way of communicating with people and you know, really supporting mothers, um, babies, fathers, and families all over the world. I think it's, you know, I, I just went into it last uh, last night, actually, and I was like, oh, okay, we better go and have a look at some of these videos. And even just the first one I was watching was about the um, calculating a due date. And I've done an article on this before. And, you know, and, and even when I was pregnant, I was like, oh, do I just tell people the wrong due date? You know, do I just tell them a few weeks in advance so I don't have that pressure? Or or I was even worried about, you know, has the, has the midwife, um, at the hospital, I was in a midwife program. Has she calculated my due date correctly? Because you know, is my cycle twenty eight days, or is it? You know, does that can that alter due dates and things like that? So I found that video really interesting. Oh, great! Oh, great! Yes, yes, and there's even a way of calculating your due date by the moon in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was really cool. Very cool. So uh, I think sometimes, yeah, people get so fixated on, even though we know it's the estimated due date, we know it's an estimation, but still, it just it's that we don't hear the estimated, we hear the due date. You know, it's that the language that is used in birth um, can sometimes get people fixated on the wrong things. I think. I think that's right, and, and you're right, estimated is really important. And babies, you know, as I said before, babies will come in their own time, and we don't want to get too fixated on a date. And I know that's sometimes tricky, especially with your first baby, because we're used to planning things and having a date. And, you know, birth is one of those things that just um, you know, doesn't function like that. It, it happens at its own time. And, and again, I think that it's actually pretty good training for parenthood, because parenting yeah. is a bit like that. Children do things in their own time, no matter what our particular agenda is. And... Um, you know, when we can really trust our bodies in birth and trust things to unfold at exactly the right time at the peak of readiness, I think that's that's a really good experience for mothers and babies. And, um, you know, as I say, don't push the river, it flows by itself. And, you know, when, when labour and birth happen in their own time, there's going to be a lot more ease with it. I didn't mention it before, but, you know, there's a system that happens in the lead up to birth and, and the few days before birth, the mother's um, system becomes much more sensitive to oxytocin, the, um, the hormone that causes contraction. So she builds up her receptors and that means that you know, on that day that she goes into labour, her body is maximally sensitive to oxytocin and she's going to have the most efficient labour possible. And if she's induced at any other time before that, then the labour efficiency is going to be compromised to some extent. And sometimes compromised so much that labour doesn't even happen. We can get a failed induction if you're really that far away from labour. Um, so, you know, really, just really trusting your body and trusting your baby is the essence of the message that I give and everything that I do. And um, I think it's really important because we, in our culture, we don't hear that from other other, other places. It's mainly information from yourself. Do you have, do you, um, is, it, is it your own experience and your own expertise? Is there other people that you either bring in? You know? I haven't as yet. I'm right. intending to do that in the future. But at the moment, I, I've got videos of myself talking about particular topics. Yeah. Some of the stuff that's covered in my book, some other things, as I said, anything that anyone wants to email me about as well. And we've got forums we're setting up. It's uh, very exciting to be um, to be to have this available to people and to be able to provide like all the all the information and all my own experiences from um, more than twenty years of of parenting and of looking at the research and of looking critically at what is really best for mothers, babies, fathers, and families. And I think it's it's I mean it's. Um, going to be beneficial for a lot of women because 
you, you know, you are quite relatable. It's not you're just coming from this medical view of this is, this is you know, this is what's happened, this is what we medically see, physiologically it, you know, works this way. But you've also done it yourself. You know, you are a mother of four and you've had your four babies at home. So I think that makes you a lot, a lot more relatable than some of the other physicians. Mm. And it's really important to me that it's not just the science because you know, the experience that we have in, in, in pregnancy and labour and birth are incredible experiences that can't be condensed down to, to science. You know, we have these incredible intuitions and we have these experiences of ecstasy and, you know, it's not just about the, the nuts and bolts and what the research says. So that's one of the things that I think is really important to bring in. And again, it's about trusting ourselves and trusting our bodies and trusting our intuition on top of all of that. Now, also, we, um, you know, obviously a lot of people in our in the community here at um, Natural Childbirth World, we have midwives and doulas as well. So there's also a professional um, membership for that as well. So, so you've got sort of two membership um, levels, don't you? So can you just explain those? Yeah, so the, so the membership level for parents is really to support them through the, the journey of the pregnancy and those videos start from the early times and uh, there's um, information appropriate to their particular time and gestation. Yeah. Uh, for professionals, those all of that is available to them as well. Um, and also professionals can ask me more questions. There's, there's more um, DVDs, more audios available. That, that'll be of interest to people that are um, caring for pregnant and uh, childbearing women. And that's really important to me to resource those people as well. And there's a lot, just a lot for me to share. Um, and we talked about physiology before. I'm actually in the middle of writing a paper, a report on the hormonal physiology of childbearing, which is all of those hormones that we talked about. Mm. So there's a lot for me to share um, with birth professionals from that perspective as well. I'm really excited about that project and that work. Wow, fascinating stuff. Um, so can you just tell us the website again? So gentlenaturalbirth.com. You can go along there and um, uh, check it out. And you can join up by the month. I have it just for the next, just for the rest of November. Mm -hmm. um, I have a special where people can join up for three years. Instead of paying $27 for parents or $37 for professionals, it's $297 for three years. Um, and you join at the professional level. Uh, which is appropriate for parents. You get all of the parenting stuff and some extra as well. Yeah. So you just have to put in the, the code PRIMAL, P-R-I-M-A-L. Mm -hmm. It was a conference I just came back from in Hawaii. So until the end of November, you can um, use that coupon code. Okay. And uh, so otherwise, for parents, it's 20, is it 27 per month? That's right, $27 a month. That's okay. Right. And so you can just go on, like if, say, you're at the late stages of your pregnancy and you just want to sort of, sort of check out some of the... The, um, the, the videos that you've done, you could just can you just do like one month or? Yes, you can do just one month. You can do just one month. Um, you need, probably best to contact me because what would usually happens when people start up is they go into the early pregnancy ones. Right. And now uh, we can arrange it that you can see the later pregnancy of the ones, the ones I'm doing right now. But when you join up for a month, you can access everything, everything that's in there. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you so much for chatting today. Is there anything else that you wanted to sort of cover or mention or, you know, spruik anything else? I just wanted to say, you know, that my take-home message is, you know, trust your body, trust your baby, trust birth, and, you know, that our bodies really are superbly designed and we can tune into our bodies, tune into our babies, and, you know, we can really, you know, we can have an ecstatic experience of birth, and that's the gift of a lifetime for yourself and your baby. Wow, that's pretty exciting, isn't it? <laughs> All right, thank you, Sarah. Dr. Sarah Buckley, um, gentlenaturalbirth.com is her new website. I've got it around the right way, haven't I? Um, so go and have a look at that and uh, let me know if you have any questions um, about this about this uh, audio recording or if you like it, like it, share it with your friends, share it with your doula. Um, let's get the message out there that you know birth is natural and normal and it can be ecstatic and really it's meant to be. So thank you. Okay, pleasure, Tracy. Thank you.